Well, a very blessed Sabbath to you. Again, I guess. Let's have a word of prayer before we begin. Will you bow your heads with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for a day that we can come to worship you. Lord, that we can come together. That we can open your word. That we can sing praises to you. Lord, today as we open your word together, we pray that our hearts and our minds would be waiting and listening and attentive to what your word is speaking to us. Lord, that we would allow the, the rest of the world to just pass by. That we would set aside the, the anxieties and the weights of the last week and the worries above tomorrow. And Lord, that today we would just rest in your presence. We rest in your mercy and rest in your grace and rest in your strength. Knowing that you're here with us. For where two or more are gathered, there you are in their midst. Lord, we thank you for the fulfillment of that promise here today. And we cherish your presence with us today. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. So if you've noticed the title of the sermon today, it's the... It's just a single word. It's the word provocation, right? A provocation. You might think, what is a provocation, right? What does it mean? What is a provocation? A provocation is an action or something that happens that causes you to become angry, which is what we typically think of, or causes something to begin or someone to start doing something. It's a provocation. You might think of incitement. Oftentimes we think of it negatively, like you, in, you provoke a riot, right? You incite a riot. That's a, provoke, a provocation. Uh, provocation means to indu- it's an inducement or an enticement, maybe uh, a stimulus, if you will, that begins something. Let me give you an example. There's a... The story goes like this. It's in the middle of the circus. Okay? And the clowns are on stage in the circles, right, in the ring. The clowns and the elephants are playing together. Okay? And it's toward the end of the performance, and the, the littlest clown has the tallest hat. Okay? And he's bowing before the crowd, and as he's bowing before the crowd, he makes this grand gesture with his hat, and it slips out of his hand and goes flying across the ring. And it lands in the next ring in front of a very large elephant. The elephant looks down at the hat. And, of course, all the crowd is watching. And the little clown is desperate to go get his hat back. But the elephant, seeing the hat, takes a couple steps over it, and he sits on it. And there sits the elephant. And the clown comes running over, and he's like, wait, wait, you know, he wants to get his hat. So he's waving at the elephant, and he's trying to shoo him off his hat, and he's hollering at him, and to no avail, the elephant just stares at him like, I'm comfortable, right? And so he's waving at him, and he gets upset, and he runs around to the backside of the elephant, and he hauls off, and he kicks him as hard as he can, and of course, he hobbles away on a very sore foot, because elephants don't kick well, right? Or you don't kick elephants well. And he comes back, and he's all the more upset now. His foot hurts and his hat is underneath this elephant and he's doing everything he can and he actually grabs the tail of the elephant and he tries to pull, it's not a lot of tail, but he pulls, trying to lift the elephant off his hat and the, the elephant has had nothing, is having nothing of it. He just sits there as if nothing is happening whatsoever. And the clown is dejected. And this is in front of the whole crowd. This is all going on. This clown is so dejected, he walks over to the other side of the ring. He sits down directly opposite to this big, stubborn elephant. And he sits on the side of the ring. He looks over and he picks up this old paper bag. He opens it up and he pulls out a peanut and he starts to eat a peanut. Well, now the elephant is interested. The elephant sees what's going on and you can see, you could see if you were there, the wheels working in the elephant's mind and the elephant looks... The elephant stands up, the elephant comes over, and stands in front of the clown. Now the clown knows what the elephant is there for. The elephant wants a peanut. And the clown at first is unwilling to share, but then the clown realizes something. He looks around the body of the elephant, and there is his hat. 
unsat upon, right? <laughs> it's free for the taking. And so the, the, the clown, all of a sudden, with joy in his face, tears the bag open and lays it on the ground to let the elephant have all he will. And he runs around the other side and he grabs his hat. Okay? That's the story. That's the story. You see, the elephant was provoked. Okay? The elephant was provoked. Provocation is when you, you entice someone, or in this case an elephant, to do something in a certain way. Right? And that provocation, that which causes the change, that which causes the move is a provocation. So when you think of prov- provoking somebody, you present to them a provocation. That's the noun, if you will. Okay? So we're talking about provocation today. The Bible talks a lot about provocations. And provoking. Mostly very, very bad. If you have your Bibles, go to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah, it's in the Old Testament there, just before Esther. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, right in there. Nehemiah chapter 9. The first text we're going to look at today is in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 18 and verse 26. God is talking about provocations. He's talking about the children of Israel. And in verse 18, he says, Yea, when they had made them a molten calf. Now, we remember when that was, right? They had just come across the Red Sea. God had done all these manifest miracles. All the plagues in Egypt, and He brought them through the Red Sea, and divided the Red Sea, and, and the sea came crashing in on the Egyptians, and they had all this done, and then they made the, golden, the molten calf. And said, This is thy God that brought thee up out of Egypt and had wrought great provocations. See, Nehemiah is reminding them of where they've come from. And he said, you remember your ancestors when they witnessed all the mighty hand of God, and as soon as they got free on the other side, they made a golden calf, and he says, and they wrought, which means they worked many provocations. Who do you think they were provoking? It wasn't Pharaoh anymore, right? Pharaoh was on the other side of the Red Sea, and his army was dead. They were provoking God with that idol. Okay, Take a look at verse 28. He continues for quite a while. And he says, But after they had rest, they did evil again before thee. Therefore leftest thou them in the hand of their enemies, so that they had dominion over them. I want to go to verse 26. (laughs) 28 is good, but I wanted to go there next. But we'll go to 26. Nevertheless, verse 26, they were disobedient and rebelled against thee, and cast thy law behind their backs. And slew thy prophets which testified against them to turn them to thee. And they wrought great provocations. So they're provoking God. Now, they're provoking God in a bad way because in verse 28, as we read, that after they had rest, they did evil again, and therefore thou leftest them in the hand of their enemies. Verse 27, he says, because they provoked you, you deliver them into the hand of their enemies. And so their provoking of God led to chastisement. Okay? If, you've, if you're a parent, you know what that feels like, being provoked into chastising your child, right? You know what that feels like. You know that point in time when you're thinking, this child is provoking me. Okay, now I'm done being provoked. <laughs> I'm going to chastise now, right? We're going to discipline now. Because there's a chastisement. This pro- provocation in Nehemiah is the word there, provocation, is very similar to the word blasphemy. Which makes sense when you think of the molten calf. right? And so in, in the words in the Bible that are translated to provoke, or provoking, or provocation, come from multiple different words, but they all mean the same similar thing. One is to provoke to wrath. One is to provoke to justice. One is to provoke to... Uh, jealousy and all these kind of things they have a specific word for each type of provocation for us we would say well you provoked me right and then you'd have to wait to find out what they did to find out what you provoked them to right you have to wait the bible words tell us differently oftentimes we think of provoking in a bad light we don't want to provoke matter of fact ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 go with me on a little little bit of a tour of the bible and the provokings within scripture Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, talking to fathers there, it says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. So you're not to provoke your children to wrath, 
right? That's a bad thing to provoke someone to become angry because you're ca- you may be causing them to sin, right? You're provoking them to wrath. That's a bad thing. Go back in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the, the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 7. I know we're, we're going to have fun finding books this morning. You will. I can't find Jeremiah. That's a big book. There it is. Jeremiah chapter 7. Beginning in verse 16. Now think of this. These people, their people are provoking God again. Listen how far they have gone. Beginning in verse 16. God is speaking and He says, Therefore pray not thou for this people. Now how far do you have to go for God to say, Stop praying for this person? You've had to go quite some time, haven't you? He says, Therefore pray not for this people, neither lift thy cry up or nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. Seest that thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto their gods that they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger, saith the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the confusion of their own faces? So in the, in the case of this people, they were, again, idolatry, uh, idolatry was rampant. They were provoking God's wrath. Now, that's not good either. Right? That's not good either. They were provoking His wrath. So we're seeing bad provoking, bad provoking, bad provoking. Turn with me to Romans chapter 11. And I'm going to show you some good provoking. Romans chapter 11. Paul is speaking here. He's talking about the situation with the Jews. Because they have been, you know, they haven't been cast off away from God individually, but as a nation. Their, their time of probation was over at the end of the 70 weeks set aside for Daniel's people, the 70 times 7, the 490 years. It, ended in th- it was going to end in 34 A.D. And he's saying, look, God's people, he says, well, well, let's read it. Verse 11, he says, speaking of the Jews, he says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Meaning that they should be cast away. He says, no, God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office, and if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. So here's Paul. He's saying, look, I'm, I'm speaking to you Gentiles, but what I'm really doing is trying to, I'm trying to provoke the Jews because those are the people of his flesh because he was a Jew through and through. He says, I'm trying to provoke the Jews to jealousy because they're going to look across this divide that they think is there because they think you're, some, you're, you're heathen, you're, you're unclean, you're Gentiles. So they're going to look across this divide and they're going to see that you have salvation and they no longer have it because they don't believe in the Savior. And hopefully by that jealousy, they think, what? You, know, you mean the Gentiles are spreading the gospel through the world? I thought God chose us as a nation to change, change the world. And he says, I'm hoping to provoke them to emulation, which means if you emulate someone, you want to be like them. We should emulate Jesus, right? We should try to emulate Him. We want to be like the Lord. He says, I want to provoke the Jews to emulation. I want them to become like me. I want them to start acting like me. I want them to grab the Gospel, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and come running across the world into every corner of this globe and saying, you need to believe in Jesus. He was the one that the leaders of the Jewish nation and the Romans crucified. He says, I want to provoke them to jealousy and to emulation. And that's a good thing. Now, sometimes you would think provoking to jealousy is bad. It kind of depends, doesn't it? Kind of depends. Provoking to jealousy in this place 
is a good thing because he wanted them to be jealous of the gospel, jealous of someone who was, had something more than what they had before. So that he was provoking them. So let's go to our text today in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. Just giving you a background on provoking in Scripture, and now I want us to take a look at this verse. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. The Bible says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and unto good work. We're supposed to consider one another. Now, this word consider means to study one another, to know one another, right? So we're to, we're to exam, we're to know and study each other. And we're to provoke each other unto love and unto good works. So there's a provoking that has to happen. Now, this is, supposed to, this is obviously a good provoking. Now, I can sit back and say, you know, I know pretty full well, and I bet all of you do too, how you, would de- how you would go about provoking someone to anger, right? I could probably, you know, I don't even have to study you that long probably to be able to provoke you to anger, but the more I know you, the faster I'm going to be able to provoke you to anger because I'm going to be able to push your buttons just right, right? But if I don't know you, maybe I'll just make something up and I'll start slandering you, I'll start, I'll start kicking you, I'll start persecuting you, I'll, I'll start lying about you, I'll, be, I'll start doing all these things trying to, trying to really get you going, right? And, and in to, to trying to provoke you to retaliate, okay? And I think most of us, if we really put our, our fallen minds to work, we could probably come up with good means of provoking each other to anger. And some of us don't even try and we do it anyway, right? Unfortunately. But how in the world do you provoke somebody to love? How do you provoke to love? And that would be a difficult question if the Bible didn't give us any help. But the Bible gives us help. You know, this word provoke here in Hebrews is only used twice in all of Scripture. This word, provoke. It's the Greek word, Paraxusmos. I like talking Greek. I have no idea what it means. It's Greek to me. But it means, it means an enticement. Enticement. Or an incitement or an irritation. Now here's the thing. We've already looked in Scripture. We know that a provoking can be an irritation, right? Don't you think it was irritating to God to see the Israelites make a golden calf and saying, this is the God that brought you through out of Egypt? That was an irritation, right? So when we provoke with an irritation, with that slant, we're provoking to wrath, we're provoking to anger, we're provoking to revenge, those kind of things, right? The, the irritation is probably something that we don't want to go after. But there's also an incitement. It also means contention which is an important portion of the definition. Because when we go to the other place in Scripture where it's used, that's what we see. So let's go to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15 is the other place in the Bible where this word provoke is used, this word paroxysmos. Acts chapter 15, verse 39. Paul and Barnabas had been working together, and now they were going to go back out and go ministering again, and they're going on a mission trip. Barnabas wants to take Mark, John Mark. Paul says, yeah, no. Don't you remember the last time he went with us? We got halfway across the country, and he decided he wanted to go home to Mama. I don't know what their argument, but that's basically what it says in the Bible. Verse 36, some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brother in every city where we've preached in the world. Uh, preach the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with him John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought it not good to take with him who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. Verse 39. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed into Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed and being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. So here's the deal. In verse 39, the word contention was so sharp. That sharp contention 
is a provoke. That's provoked. Okay? That's the provocation, the provocation, the sharp contention. It's the same word. There's this sharp contention between the two. And it caused them to actually divide and go their separate way. It was a provocation. That's this word. And so a provoking then it seems to cause a contention or an irritation in the mind or between people. But we're talking about individually now. You're being provoked. Imagine yourself being provoked, and I don't, you know, somebody's, I don't know, constantly stepping on your toe, or constantly taking your parking place at work, or constantly running, run, driving by and taking a baseball bat and knocking your mailbox off its post. That's maybe a little more Minnesotan than something else. Somebody's constantly, and they're being, you're being provoked. It's this irritation in your mind. And it's this contention now. Because you have a contention growing. The more and more it happens, the contention grows and it grows and it grows. And if they provoke me anymore, I'm going to explode. Right? So there's this contention that grows. There's this, this pressure that grows in a mind. That's how this works. And so for us to under, understand, we have to, we have to understand how... How, how do I provoke someone to love? I've got to understand how provoking works. And the Bible says provoking is a contention. It's an irritation. It's an, an inciting to action. It's, it, it's something that, that it just grates on you. You know, you use those terms. If something is grating on you, it's provoking you. So it has to have this... In, this irritation. So, so think back to our elephant, okay? Think back to our friendly elephant sitting on the hat. There he is. He's comfortable on the hat, right? And this little clown guy is bouncing around and he's doing all these things. That doesn't excite him. It doesn't incite him. It doesn't irritate him. It's not doing anything. Matter of fact, you really wouldn't want to irritate an elephant, right? And when they get mad, they get kind of, they break stuff. But this, this little guy up here, the elephant is looking at him and says, look, this does not entice me. This is not causing any contention in my mind whatsoever. No irritation whatsoever. He just looks at the clown. And the clown goes across the ring and sits down and he pulls out a peanut. And all of a sudden, in the elephant's mind, there is an incitement. There is a contention. What's the contention? Well, it's comfortable sitting on the hat. But that peanut sure looks good. And there's a bag full of them. And so the, the, now the elephant has to decide. Sit on the hat, go get a peanut. 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 I gotta go get a peanut. Right? And that's exactly what happened to the that's exactly what happened to the elephant. He was enticed, he was incited. The peanuts won out. The provocation, even though it seemed so simple. The clown didn't even mean to provoke him anymore. He was done with it. He was, he was off mourning his own loss. And the, but the, the peanut provoked the elephant. It incited the elephant to get off the hat. How then do we provoke someone to love? We have to create a contention. And God gives us an example of how to do that. Take your Bible and go to 1 John. 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. Here is God creating an irritation in your fallen mind or a contention in your fallen mind. First John chapter 4. If you're there, look at verse 19. We love Him because He first loved us. So how do, you, how do you provoke someone to love you the same way God provoked you to love Him? You love them first. 
You see, here's the contention in the fallen mind, in this fallen, sinful, fleshly mind, like the Bible tells us in Galatians. That, see, our flesh wars against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. They are contrary to one another. I think it's in Galatians 5, 7 or something like that. Our flesh is contrary to the Spirit of God. And so when, God, when the character of God is presented before us, our flesh, it creates a contention in our mind. Because our flesh wants to go this way. If someone doesn't like you, someone doesn't love the Lord and they don't love you, and, and you want to say, oh, I want them to know the Lord and I want them to... And so you start loving them. It creates a contention in their mind. Why is this person doing this? They're really irritating me. Being so good, so kind. Why are they doing that? You, you, hear the, you hear the contentious questions starting to happen? The, the, the wheels beginning to turn just like the elephant going, hey, wait a minute, there's a peanut over there. And you start seeing all this happening, and they're not giving you anything in return. They didn't even ask for all this, but, but here you are, you're showing them love. Just like God was, was showing love to the world. A, a world that was in rebellion had turned their back on Him. That, so much so, God said, look, the devil is running around telling you that God is not good, that God is not merciful, that God is not love. That God loves to destroy people and, 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 and burn them forever through the ceaseless ages of time. He's some sort of sadistic dictator. And God says, I'm sending my son to prove you wrong. You didn't ask for him, but here he is. He's going to live, he's going to suffer, and he's going to die. He's going to be the most humble man you've ever seen on the face of the earth, and he's going to do it just for you whether you like Him or love Him or not. And God provokes you to love Him back. That's a provocation that God lays out for the whole world. And you think, how do you provoke somebody to love? Yes, loving someone provokes them to love you back. How do I know? Because I love the Lord. And you love the Lord. And thousands and millions of people throughout all of time love the Lord for what He's done for them. And all He did was love them first. And so if I want to provoke someone to love, I must show them love. It happens time and time again in the Bible. Time and time again in the Scripture, it shows us that. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Did I tell you today was a Bible study? I'll warn you now that we're almost over. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Verse 13, 14, 15, and 16. Now, you might think this is totally off topic, but hang with me here. It says, "...and the woman which hath a husband that believeth not..." And if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. Or a brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or what knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Here's the principle. You love the Lord and you're saved and you know the Lord loves you. And you have a spouse that you love, but they don't necessarily love the Lord. How do you show them that God loves them? How do you provoke them to love? Because loving me isn't enough. My spouse loving me is not enough. I want them to love the Lord. That's the first and foremost. That's the most important thing. How do I provoke them to love? Because God is love. Here the Bible is saying, look, are you a believer? Stay there. Continue to love this person. Continue to, to do good things for this person. Continue to shower them with the love that God has showered you with. And who knows? Maybe the contention will be so great in their mind you will provoke them to love God. And that they'll be saved. 
Time and time again, the Bible shows the same principle going over and over and over. We could, we could think back to different times in, in Scripture. I could think of uh, Jacob and Esau. We don't have to go there, but when Jacob is coming back to, to the land of Canaan from, from where he was, he's coming to meet Esau, and he hears that Esau is coming at him with 400 armed men. Esau is still a little upset about the whole porridge thing, right? He's upset about, about missing out on his birthright, and even though he has everything. And, and so Jacob, not only does he pray, Lord, you, know, you need to save me, but he sends gifts ahead of him. He sends flocks of gifts, and another flock of gifts, and, and another flock of gifts. And the message goes forward, forth each time. These are from your servant, Jacob. Not the one who has the birthright, your servant. And so it's constantly this, this good deeds in, and these gifts in front of a hum, humble, loving attitude that Jacob comes to. And by the time Esau meets him, he doesn't raise a sword. He raises his arms and he gives his brother a hug. He provoked Esau to love him. It works over and over and over again. It's, it's, a, it's amazing. You know, when I first read, ran across this verse, I, I was like, Lord, what does it mean to provoke someone to love? And so I started looking at and I've kind of been mulling this over for a while and going back and forth and seeing, well, what, where is it in Scripture? How does this explain? But so over and over again, the Bible, it's the theme of Scripture. Romans chapter 12. Also, you're close there. You're in 1 Corinthians. Flip over to Romans chapter 12. I mean, it, it's so clear when you, when you start seeing it. Verse 20 of Romans chapter 12 and verse 21 says, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him, provoke him. If he thirst, provoke him, <laughs> give him a drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. He's going to have such contention in his mind. He's going to have such an irritation in his mind. His conscience is going to be so pricked. He's going to have to stop and make a decision. This person loves me. Why? Why do you love me? I hate you. Right? That's, he's your enemy. Right? That's the question that's going on in his mind. Why does this person love me? I hate them. I've done everything in my power to make them know <laughs> that I hate them. And yet they love me. Why? Where does this love come from? And the only way that love can be there is if you're filled with the love of God. If you've received that love, then you can freely give that love. If you know what it is. Because then verse 21 says, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So if you see evil in the world... Go provoke it with good. Right? Just back up a little bit. It might get messy at first. Okay? It says provoke it. Provoke to love. You know, in Ephesians, I don't want to leave everybody out. You know, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, God tells husbands to love your wives as Christ loved the church. You know, when you think of it in a marriage situation, when you think of husband and wife and sometimes how there's contentions that grow between people and they go, well, we just don't love each other anymore. He doesn't love me anymore. She doesn't love me anymore. You know how you fix that? You love them anyway. He said, husbands, love your wife just like Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He gave himself for it. He was willing to die for the church. You want to fix a marriage that's struggling and a, and a relationship that's struggling, what you do is you stand back and you say, nothing of me, but I'm going to love this person till the day I die. And I'm going to love them. And I'm going to love them. No matter what their reaction is, I'm going to love them. And they're going to have the same conflict that that enemy had. Why do you love me? Why are you doing this? And it's going to change them because you overcome evil with good. That's what the Bible says. Provoking one another to love. There's a warning, though, as we close. I need to give you a warning. 
it matters with what you use to provoke somebody with. That noun, that provocation, what do you use to use as a provocation for love? That matters. Because it has to be genuine, and it has to be real. It can't be superficial. It can't be fake. Years ago, not that many years ago, well, a fair amount of years ago, it's history, there was a priest in a little tiny town. I don't know. Call it? I can't remember. It's in Russia. I can't say the word. It's, it's a long town. Right? There's this priest in Russia, and he's trying to get the children to come to the church school. So he starts handing out candy to get them to come to school. But he wants them to also to learn the Bible. So if they learn their verse and they can speak it well, he gives them candy. And he had one young man from the surrounding farms that would come, and he was, he was just, boy, he, he's a pugnacious little guy, you know, a little stout guy. And he, boy, he'd learn that verse, and he'd say it with piety and everything, and he'd get his candy, and whoosh, off into the woods he'd go, and he'd eat his candy. Right? Well, he, this priest started to like this young man. And so he encouraged him to come to the church school. And, and so he'd be started to attend the school. And the priest would give him, continue to give him incentives like candy to learn more and more of the Bible and to do his schoolwork. As a matter of fact, he, he learned so much of the Bible, he memorized all four Gospels and he was awarded this great reward because he stood up in front of the church and he recited all four Gospels at one time, front to back. That's amazing. all from being enticed with a little bit of candy. Sixty years later, that boy was still reciting Scripture, but not in the way that the priest would have been proud of. See, the little boy's name was Nikita Khrushchev. And if you know history, Nikita Khrushchev was, a, was known as like the atheist dictator of Russia. He said, he would quote his scripture and he said, but none of this is true because when my cosmonauts were in space, they didn't see God. And he totally went away from everything that he'd memorized. Everything that he'd been provoked to learn was cast aside because it wasn't, it wasn't provoked <laughs> with anything that was of sincerity. It was a piece of candy. That's all it was worth to Nikita, was candy. It wasn't worth anything in here. So if I'm choosing to provoke someone to love, it has to come from here. It can't be superficial actions. It can't be this, that, or the other thing. It has to be real. It has to be sincere. And that's the warning I have for you, because otherwise their action isn't going to be that way either. Because you know when God came and provoked you and I, that was real. And that was as sincere as it gets. And so when we choose to provoke one another to love, oh, <laughs> provoke to love and good works. Right? So don't get me wrong today. I'm not saying love, 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 and don't worry about anything else. Right? The Bible says provoke one another unto love and to good works. You might say to love and to righteousness. How do you provoke someone to righteousness? Not with a whip. <laughs> and not with peanuts. But by exampling love and righteousness. People will be provoked because they will see the blessing of God in your life for following the words that God has shown you in the Word. And they are going to have a contention in their mind. There are people who follow their own way and do their own thing. Look, this is why Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You see, the Bible, it's just, you can't get away from all these texts because they all blend together. Because they all fit together. They all tie together. The whole principle of the Bible is to provoke one another unto love and to good works. God is provoking you and I unto love and unto good works by exampling them and giving Himself for us, giving us an example not only of self-sacrifice and self-denial in Jesus Christ as He laid down His life innocently, willingly, for a whole world of people who were in rebellion. Who at the time He was here, virtually nobody could care less. 
God laid that down for us. He said, look, this is, this is what love looks like. This is what victory will be. And this is what righteousness looks like. And this is the reward of righteousness as well. And He gives us all of that. And He entices us. He provokes us to be just like Him. So a provocation. You want to provoke someone, love them first. Love them much. And love them always. God does that for you too. So I give you permission, just as God does. You can leave from this place today. Go provoke somebody. Amen? Amen. Let's close with our closing hymn. Hymn 458. Hymn 458.